this is a continuation of the um, discussion we uh, finished with last week, isn't it? About the snake and the rope. Does anyone remember that example? Yeah? Can you share that with us? What that means? Tashi Matuji? I can't remember it properly off the top of my head, to be honest with you, but is it just, it's about how we perceive things to be because um, we lack in knowledge. We're lacking in, in, in knowledge and that therefore we can misinterpret something. Yeah, 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 that's nice, nicely put. So <clears throat> in the material world, we think that something is going to help us like climb out of this material world something is going to make us happy so then we take that to be a rope which we can climb out of our misery <laughs> actually it could be a snake <laughs> and if you mistake a, a, uh, a rope for a, a, if you mistake a um, rope for a snake you get into more trouble it's like in the material world, if you think something's going to make you happy and then you go after it and you realize it's not really what you thought it was, right? Make you, again, just in the same position in the material world. So yeah, that's because, like you said, because you don't have knowledge, isn't it? Hare Krishna, sorry, uh, I've lost the page, so can you tell me which way we are? Okay, we're on the paragraph. We just with the one we just read is a paragraph which begins uh, if one therefore thinks that the super soul is something different from the personality sorry i'm just completely lost today it's in chapter 14. chapter 14. yeah yeah it's about halfway through i think halfway through. quite a few is pages the in the continued or yeah, prayers offered by Lord Brahma is the name of the chapter. And the okay. paragraph begins, if one therefore thinks that the super soul is something different. Anybody got a page number? Okay. It's different books, Mataji, that I'm, different was... editions are different size print, so it varies. And mine is 161, but it could be very different in other books. No. I've got page 147. 147 on this book. Yeah, so it's like 20, 20 pages away. <laughs> I mean, this, this one. Here. Which book do you have, Mataji? I've got this book. Okay, I have this one. So it's another different. Oh, different. <laughs> Completely yeah. different. Okay. Uh, has anyone else got that book? Which might be Mataji. This is um, about halfway, though. Yeah, it's about halfway. It, it, Really high. 108, 109 page. Okay, I'll let you carry on finding it, Mataji, while we continue. Okay, continue. Sorry, that's fine. <clears throat> Sorry? Okay, I so can so. I say something? Can I just okay. say? Go on, Prabhu. Yeah. I have a phone. What you want to can you hear? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Go on. Can you... Hare, Hare Krishna. Mr. Yeah. Satana, I'm speaking here. Yeah, they can hear you. Okay. Hare Bol. Hare Bol. No one responding. He's not responding. Hare Bol, they said Hare Bol. You can hear you, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. All oh, right. Okay. Hare Krishna. Yeah, good. Hare Krishna. Yes, uh, it's uh, connecting with the previous paragraph we read. And uh, we, we discuss, uh, as you said, uh, as long as um, we do bhakti yoga and uh, we're not worried about uh, liberation or anything. And uh, I can't remember the young Mataji's name. And she was saying that. Uh, as long as we continue devotional service, uh, Krishna always helps. So 
in, in addition, what I'm saying, because sometimes it can happen that Krishna does, it, uh, does help, but uh, according to our expectation. And uh, we can't understand that. It's out of our understanding, but still we learn that um, we continue devotional service as long as we do bhakti yoga and whether it's a plus or minus, um, Krishna is helping both way, either way. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you for adding that. Yeah, so we see things in terms of plus and minus. We think the more plus we have, the better. The less minus we have, the better. Isn't it? But some people, one person's, uh, how do you say? One person's food is another man's poison, isn't it? Have you heard that saying before? One man's food is another man's poison. So everyone has a different idea that what's good and what's not good. But Krishna has the supreme understanding. He has the best interest for us. So if we are surrendered to Krishna, then and we have faith in Krishna, that he will always do the best for us, then that is the safest position, isn't it? So we don't always know what is best for us. So when something doesn't go our way, but we are surrendered to Krishna, but we have faith in Krishna, then we should know that that's what Krishna wants. Thank you, Prabhu. So Krishna uh, says in Bhagavad Gita, as is mentioned in this paragraph also, that you should give up all other process for self-realization and surrender. So Krishna, when he says Sarva Dharma Parityaja, very famous verse, Bhagavad Gita, 1866, that uh, you should give up all other dharmas. He doesn't mean that uh, sarva dharma prithyaja. It doesn't mean that you should give up dharma meaning. You shouldn't be a Muslim. You shouldn't be Christian. You shouldn't be a Buddhist. Well, because all those dharmas were not around 5,000 years ago. When Krishna was speaking Bhagavad Gita. So when he says sarva dharma prithyaja, he doesn't mean that you give up all this type of religions. And just be my, just be, just be Hindu or just be Krishna conscious. Uh, his con devotee, he doesn't just say it that way because none of these things were around. What he means really is you give up trying to um, fulfill all other duties. What your duties are, they, you do them all for me. Surrender to me. Surrender all, all that you have and all that you've lost. You give it always to me. So you accept everything as, as Krishna's mercy. That's what he's saying. Um, I also picked up one more thing from this paragraph. Um, because someone asked, I think it was maybe last week or the week before. Um, now what does it mean that Krishna is unlimited? Someone asked this question a week or so ago. What does it mean? How can a person, you know, has a like a physical, let's say, a physical presence? How can that person be unlimited? How can they keep growing and growing and growing and growing? Huh? How they can keep expanding? And then we discussed that in some detail. But he has an interesting point. It says, one who is transcendental to such a position understands that you are unlimited. You are both within and without. Therefore, your presence is everywhere. So, uh, Srila Prabhupada writes here that unlimited means that Krishna is within and without. He is within this universe or within our heart and he's also outside of our heart. Yeah? He's also present in his own place in Goloka Vrindavan. And that's exactly what Lord Brahma saw. He thought that Vishnu is always in my heart. But he didn't realize Vishnu was standing in front of him as Krishna, isn't it? So that's what it means to understand someone is unlimited, or rather that Krishna is unlimited. He's within and without, because nobody else can do that. 
So I also thought that was an, an interesting point here. So if so anyone would like to say something. Sure. Go on, go on. Uh, Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Hare Krishna. It's, uh, so something regarding unlimited. Now Krishna is unlimited, we are limited. And my understanding is uh, Krishna is uh, unlimited means rules and regulations are for us because we are limited, not for Krishna. And that's how, how he's unlimited. He can do what he's like. He can break the uh, our rules, not his rules, because he hasn't got the rules. <laughs> yeah. That's another wonderful definition. Thank you, Prabhu. So yeah. Krishna, he's not bound by any rules. Huh? He's not conditioned. That's yeah. right. He's, he's unconditioned. He's always pure. So Srila Prabhupada gives an example in this connection, which I can remember. Um, just Prabhupada says that, um, you know, urine is impure. So if, you if, if there is ur urine spill and you touch it, it becomes impure. It's an impure thing, isn't it? But the sun, it can, the sun can, uh, what do you call it, um, um, evaporate, even urine. Yeah. But the sun doesn't become impure because it evaporates the urine. Huh? It can evaporate water from the ocean, it can evaporate urine from the land and so on. But the sun doesn't become impure because the sun is so powerful. Yeah. So Prabhupada gives that example. That Krishna, even though he can do so many things which are seemingly moral or immoral, he's not affected by anything. Because his situation is always pure. He's always, he's unlimited. Yeah, yeah sun is very powerful, but Krishna is more, more powerful than the sun. The sun. <laughs> hmm, that's right. Well, there's another uh, point made in this paragraph about that. So <clears throat> here it says that uh, where was that point? I can't seem to find it now, but that's okay. So let's let's continue then. One who has attained a little result of devotional service can understand your glories. Even one striving for Brahman realization or Paramatma realization cannot understand these features of your personality unless you bestow on him the result of at least a slight bit of devotional service. One may be the spiritual master of many impersonalists, or he may go to the forest or to a mountain cave and meditate as a hermit for many, many years but he can't understand your glories without having been favoured by a slight degree of devotional service. Brahman realisation or Paramatma realisation are also not possible even after one searches for many, many years, unless one is touched by the wonderful effect of devotional service. So, there's two terms which have been occurring and these few paragraphs, and that is uh, Brahman realization and Paramatma realization. Um, so, what does it mean, realization? Does anyone know? What does that word mean? Have a guess, it's okay. I've seen a few more uh, devotees have joined. Awareness. Don't feel, don't feel fright. Uh, don't feel uh, shy to put your camera on. We can see you, <laughs> so we can have a room conversation together. Yes, <laughs> Shashi Mataji. Is it awareness? Realization is awareness. Yes, that's one way of putting it. Yeah. So someone who is aware of Brahman, they realize, they they acknowledge, they are conscious of it. Yeah. Or if someone is aware of Paramatma, 
and that means they realize that they can you know perceive paramatma in the heart yeah that's a nice way of putting it so Prabhupada, he's saying he's he's coming he's bringing these points out in these last few paragraphs lord brahma is bringing these points out that um there's different levels of realization isn't it <clears throat> So there's a hierarchy. Can you say what that hierarchy is? So there's some there's one level of realization and there's a higher level and then there's a higher level like that. So it's Brahman, then Paramat Paramatma, and then it's um the personal um then there's like Krishna, the personal body. Yeah. So this is explained um all throughout Srimad Bhagavatam. And even in Bhagavad Gita, um, but different commenters on the absolute truth, they have different focuses on what the absolute truth is. Yeah. So some they conclude that the absolute truth is Brahman, just impersonal, just light, just effulgence. Others they conclude that the absolute is the Lord within the heart. Um, yeah, the conclusion of the Vedas is that Supreme is the personality of Godhead, Krishna or Vishnu. So that's the realizations, uh, the, or the different perceptions of the truth. So, <clears throat> right at the beginning of the Srimad Bhagavatam, um, it's mentioned that. Um, that they, that all of these three are the absolute truth, but the Bhagavan realization is the highest. So, <clears throat> because Bra the thing with uh, Brahman realization is that um, that effulgence it comes from somewhere. We discussed last week that effulgence of the it comes from the body of the Lord. Um, and the thing with the Paramatma realization, that's also a limited understanding because the Paramatma is in the heart of everyone. But someone who's in the spiritual world, someone who has a spiritual body, who doesn't have a material body, there's no Paramatma in that heart because they are already relating with Krishna face to face directly. So Bhagavan is, is the highest realization. Because Krishna, he expands himself into Brahman. He expands himself into everyone's heart as Paramatma. So that's the complete understanding. And that's why he said in the previous paragraph that he's unlimited. He's both within and without. So we could continue unless there's any comments or questions. Should we go to the next reader and then we'll try and uh, have some more readers. It would be nice if we can all read a little bit this week, as I said at the beginning. So please put your name down for reading, even if it's just a little bit. Okay, so we can um, have Jay Prakash Prabhu now. Therefore, my dear Lord, I pray that I may be so fortunate that in this life or in another life, wherever I may take my birth, I may be counted as one of your devotees. Wherever I pray, wherever I may be, I pray that I may be engaged in your devotional service. I do not even care what form of life I get in the future, because I can see that even in the form of cows, calves or coward boys, the devotees are so fortunate to always be engaged in your transcendental loving service and association. Therefore, I wish to be one of them instead of such an exalted person as I am now, for I am full of ignorance. The gopis and cows of Vrindavan are so fortunate that they have been able to supply the breast milk to you. Persons who are engaged in performing great sacrifices and offering many vulnerable, valuable goats in sacrifice cannot attain the perfection of understanding you. But simply by devotional service, 
these innocent village women and cows are all able to satisfy you with their milk. You have drunk their milk to satisfaction, yet you are never satisfied as much by those engaged in performing sacrifices. I am simply surprised. Therefore, with the fortunate positions of Maharaj Nanda, Mother Yashoda and the coward men and copies, because you, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Absolute Truth, are existing here as their most intimate, lovable object. My dear Lord, no one can actually appreciate the good fortune of these residents of Vrindavan. We are all demigods controlling deities at the various senses of the living entities. And we are proud of enjoying such privileges. But actually, there is no comparison between our position and the position of these fortunate residents of Vrindavan, because they are actually relishing your presence and enjoying your association by dint of the sensory activities. We may be proud of being controllers of the senses, but here the residents of Vrindavan are so transcendental that they are not under our control. Actually, they are enjoying their senses through service to you. I shall therefore consider myself fortunate to be given a chance to take birth in this land of Rindawan in any form in any of my future lives. It's a very nice prayer, this one, isn't it? This paragraph is particularly sweet. Um, he's really praying here, Lord Brahma. What is he praying for in this paragraph? To take birth in Vrindavan? Yeah, yeah. He's he's realizing that the best place to be born is in Vrindavan. <laughs> like he's the controller of the universe, Lord Brahma, isn't it? He's the creator of the universe. And he's saying all of the devas, they're all so powerful. They will control all the senses of all the living beings. <clears throat> But still, they're not as powerful as the residents of Vrindavan. <clears throat> so I thought of um, I thought of three examples, um, just from this uh, first couple, first sentence or two, um, because Lord Brahma is saying that to be born in Vrindavan is so fortunate. So we see different devotees at different times have prayed to be born in Vrindavan and. Uh, so it's it's nice to kind of see how that mood, they, what kind of mood they have, you know. So Lord Brahma here, he's praying to be born in Vrindavan. And um, in one place is described that uh, Krishna blessed him that he could be born uh, to perform service in Vrindavan in the form of a hill. Okay. So in Barsana, the home of Srimati Radharani. Uh, as we all, as we might be familiar with that song, Barsani Bali, Sri Radhe. Yeah? She is the, uh, she is in, in Varsana. And, uh, and these four hills, Varsana has four hills. Each one of those hills is a, a head of Lord Brahma. So Krishna gave him this blessing that your heads will be hills. And all the residents of Vrindavan, they will walk on these hills. <coughs> so this was a blessing that he got from Krishna. So Krishna reciprocated with him. Krishna fulfilled his desire. He blessed him. And Lord Brahma, he wasn't proud that, you know, uh, he, or rather he wasn't uh, ashamed that, you know, the residents of Vrindavan were walking on his head. We would feel... How would we feel if someone was stepping on our head? <laughs> Not too good. But Lord Brahma, he's feeling more fortunate in that position of being a hill than being Lord Brahma because he came to his understanding of how special Vrindavan is. So those four, those four hills they are known as the heads of Brahma in Varsana. Another place we'll read in later chapter, Udhava, Krishna... Krishna's own cousin, Uddhava, who was actually his minister uh, when Krishna became the king of uh, 
Dwarka, Mathura. Then uh, <coughs> Krishna sent Uddhava to see what, how are the devotees doing in Vrindavan. And when Uddhava went there, he was so surprised, he was so amazed how deeply devoted the residents of Vrindavan were. But he also prayed in a similar way. That I just want to be the servant of the devotees of Vrindavan. He said, even if I'm just a shrub on the outskirts of Vrindavan, if I'm just a blade of grass somewhere and the devotees step on me, that would be a better position for me than being, you know, the minister of Krishna in his, in his, in his royal palaces. So he prayed like that. And another one that came to mind was um, our, our Acharya Bhaktivinoda Thakur. Uh, because here the prayer of Lord Brahma, he's saying he wants to just be counted amongst one of the devotees. And uh, in, so in that connection, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, um, he prayed that even if I, I'd rather, I'd rather not be born in a very prestigious position in this world um, if I was not to have devotional service. He said, rather I'd be born like a dog in the house of uh, a devotee. I'd rather be born like a dog who gets fed prasadam than to be born in a very opulent setting where I forget Krishna. So that was his prayer. So you see in many, many places, these were just three examples that came to my mind. Um, how, how glorious Vrindavan is, how very exalted personalities, they uh, have that desire to be connected with the Vaishnavas, to be connected with Vrindavan. Yeah. Okay. So one more paragraph, unless anyone wants to comment. Okay, cool. My dear Lord, I am therefore not interested in either material opulences or liberation. I am most humbly praying at your lotus feet for you to please give me any sort of birth within, the, within this Vrindavan forest so that I may be able to be favoured by the dust of the feet of some of the devotees of Vrindavan. If I am given the chance to grow as a humble blade of grass, in this land, that would be glorious birth for me. But if I'm not so fortunate to take birth within this forest of Vrindavan, I beg to be allowed to take birth outside the immediate area of Vrindavan, so that when the devotees go out, they will walk over me. Even that would be great fortune for me. I'm just aspiring for the birth in which I shall be smeared by the dust of the devotees' feet because I can see that everyone here is simply full of Krishna consciousness. No one here knows anything but the lotus feet of Krishna or Mukunda, for which the Vedas themselves are searching. So there's a nice continuation of this prayer. Um, here is particularly mentioned the he, Lord Brahma wants to be favoured by the dust, the dust of the feet of the devotees. Yeah. Um, so there's a there's a famous uh, prayer, which is called uh, Shuddha Bhakta Charanarena. It's a famous Bengali prayer in our tradition, and it's all about attaining the mercy of the devotees. Uh, and it's all about the um, begging at the dust of the feet of the devotees. <laughs> because the devotees, where they step, they sanctify that place. They purify anywhere they go. So, what to speak of the devotees of Vrindavan, who are all pure, and also Krishna, who is the supreme pure, who is walking around in Vrindavan, how pure is the, the dust of Vrindavan? When we think of dust, we think it's impure. But this dust is the opposite. <laughs> the dust itself is purifying. <laughs> to get that kind of dust, you know. We think if we get dusty, we go take a shower huh, to become clean. 
But here, if we were to bathe in this dust, we'd become more clean than any shower could make us clean. <laughs> because that's how pure that dust is. Because that dust will, it will clean our consciousness. It's not dust which, it's not, it's not something which will clean us physically. It will awaken us spiritually. That's the power of this dust. And therefore, Vrindavan is also known as uh, Chintamani Dham because the dust is called uh, the dust of Vrindavan is called Chintamani and uh, that means that the dust itself, it can awaken spiritual desires. So why is Lord Brahma talking about this? Because he's there in this pastime, he's there, he's bowing down to Krishna as he's speaking these things. His head is in that dust and he's speaking these things and his desire is actually being fulfilled by this chintamani, by this spiritual dust. So who would have thought we could say so much about dust? There's lots to say. <laughs> Even songs have been written about. Um, so we can maybe have the next reader now, Shashi Mataji. Um, I have a question. Sure. Um, which body was Brahma in before attaining birth in Vrindavan? Before attaining birth in Vrindavan? Yeah. Um, I'm not clear on that, actually. Um, as far as I understand, um, Krishna gave him this benediction that he could be the he could be present on the hills of Rasana. So I I would speculate to say that he was this this form of Brahma and then he became blessed to be those hills. So that would have happened after, from my understanding. Is that like because he's just carrying out his duty for creation, so it's not as if he can directly serve the Lord in that way to attain birth in Vrindavan, you know, you'd have to like go through the actual practice, you know, to get there. So at the same time, um, while, while the devotees um, are in the position of demigods, they can still come and perform this, their service to Krishna. Um, so that happens, we see that often, that happens. Um, because even Lord Brahma, he came in the past times of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as Haridas Thakur. He came in that form as Haridas Thakur. So because the Lord comes here on scheduled incarnations to perform uh, specific pastimes, you know, the demigods, they take a holiday. They go in for a, for a moment, they go in. Uh, join the pastimes of the Lord, and then they go back to their position. They can do simultaneously. So when the Lord comes, he engages everyone in his pastime, and they go back to their role again. Thank you. So this pastime happened over the course of one year, but for Lord Brahma, that was one moment. So one lifetime of Krishna's pastimes here, or Lord Chaitanya's pastimes here, is, is not more than a a few moments in the in the in the higher planets, the time the time scale of the heavenly planets. So can they can they can accommodate doing that service? Okay. Thank you. Answer. <laughs> okay, would you like to read now, Mataji? It is confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita that the purpose of Vedic knowledge is to find Krishna. And it is said in the Brahma, Brahma Hita that it is very difficult to find Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, by systematic reading of the Vedic literature. But he is very easily available through the mercy of a pure devotee. The pure devotee of Vrindavana are fortunate because they can see Mukunda, Lord Krishna, all the time. 
this word Mukunda can be understood in two ways. Muk means liberation. Lord Krishna can give liberation and therefore transcendental bliss. The word also refers to his smiling face, which is just like the Kunda flower, Mukha, means face. The Kunda flower is very beautiful and it appears to be smiling, thus the comparison is made. Yes, yeah, so <clears throat> here he said how the, the Vedas, um, the last sentence in the previous paragraphs says that the Vedas are looking for Krishna. What could that mean? That the Vedas are looking for Krishna? <laughs> Can anyone say? Hard to know if um, anyone's still here. There's not many people on video anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so the Vedas, are they looking for Krishna? How are they looking for Krishna? It's understood that the Vedas, they're all personalities. Rig Veda, the Sama Veda, the Yajurathava Veda, the different Upanishads, they're all different personalities. They're like the knowledge of, of the Ve that that particular text is personified. There's a personality who is behind that. Very interesting concept, isn't it? <laughs> so the Vedas, they're not abstract. Everything has personality. And so even those personalities, even though they embody that particular aspect of the Vedic knowledge, each one of those persons, uh, even those persons, they're looking for Krishna. That's how this uh, paragraph begins. And uh, and, and for them, it's even very difficult to find Krishna, uh, as he said here. Because unless you know, unless you know Krishna, you cannot be liberated. Because Krishna is the one who gives liberation. No one else can give. Only Krishna can give liberation. So he has the name Mukunda. So Lord Brahma in these prayers, he re continually refers to Krishna as Mukunda, 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 Mukunda. Um, just like the residents of Vrindavan, they call Krishna Mukunda as well. But they have a different meaning to that word when they say Mukunda. So what's the other meaning of the word Mukunda? Did anyone know? Or did anyone catch that? I think I would like to say something, Haribo Prabhu. Okay. Go on, Prabhu. Yeah, uh, this is regarding uh, uh, your question, uh, uh, Vedas looking for Krishna. My understanding is Vedas looking for Krishna means uh, they don't want to be disappeared. So they want uh, people uh, to study continuously because uh, otherwise uh, what happens if we don't, if we don't study Vedas then uh, uh, one day they would disappear. They don't die. Okay. Disappear means out of uh, our life. Mm. So they become uh, meaningless. I see. Okay. So, so Vedas want to remain forever. Hmm. Is, that, is that correct? That's my understanding. Is um, yes, that may be. That may be also the case, Prabhu. Um, 
as I understood from what has been written here, um, because there's, there's a particular um, perspective here. So maybe I could just read that again. Uh, where it said that uh, it is said in the Brahma Samhita that it is very difficult to find Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, by systematic reading of the Vedic literature. So first he said that it's difficult to find Krishna just by reading and reading. Then it said that, but he is very really easy, he is very, really e very easily available through the mercy of a pure devotee. So, whilst what you're saying may be true also, and can be true also, the focus, the focus here is that uh, My understanding is that that mm. uh, yeah, uh, as it says that just reading uh, uh, Vedic literature or anything, we won't be able to understand un uh, unless a pure devotee will show us like Guru, and that, that's why I need to have a uh, shelter of a Guru as well to help us to understand uh, Krishna as well. So that's why Vedas looking for Krishna and uh, Guru can help us to find the Krishna in Vedic uh, literatures. <laughs> it's a conflict. <laughs> no, looking for Krishna means Krishna's mercy. Yeah, Krishna's mercy. To, uh, to, uh, to understand the Vedas. Yeah, yeah, we need the mercy, saying, to understand Krishna. And so always, uh, that's why devotees association is very important for us. Yes. So one may ask, then, um, why does it? Why is it so difficult to find Krishna in the Vedas? <laughs> Surely, if you pick up a book, any book, you have a beginning, middle, and end, and you read it all, then you will understand the book, isn't it? generally speaking, right? Any book, you have a beginning, middle, end, you read it. Okay, this is what happened in the beginning. This was talked about in the middle. And then this is how it ended, isn't it? So why is it not, why is it given here that just by reading, even systematically, you know, thoroughly, you know, part by part in sequence, it's very difficult to understand Krishna. Why? Because the Vedas are so vast that actually no one can complete systematic reading of the Vedas. Krishna incarnated, he himself incarnated as Vedyas to write these Vedas. Hmm? Because in the previous times, there wasn't books of Vedas. They were just spoken and understood. Thus, someone says it, understood. These days, even if you read Bhagavad Gita time and again, Still, it doesn't go in. <laughs> huh? 700 verses are not there. <laughs> Seven verses is challenging also. <laughs> yeah. So, it's very difficult to understand because the Vedas are so vast. They cover so many aspects of life. That it's very easy to be distracted by our desire. Hmm? Because our desire is not for Krishna in the Vedas. Therefore, we can't find Krishna in the Vedas. We go to read the Vedas, we'll find astrology, we'll find, uh, you know, Ayurveda, health, we'll find uh, the construction of the universe, cosmology. We could find all these things, you know, oh, this is interesting, oh, this is interesting, oh, this is interesting. But the pure devotee is interested in Krishna. When he reads the Vedas, he sees Krishna. <laughs> Whether he's reading... Ayurveda and he sees Danvantri, whether he's reading cosmology and he sees the Virat Rup, or whether he's reading what have you, uh, then everything for him is Krishna. Because his desire is Krishna. He has, he has that, uh, you know, he's, he ha his lotus feet is on that Chintamani Dham. He is in that, he is concerned already with the dust of Vrindavan. So this is why. It's important that we can get the Vedas through the devotee because we'll be lost otherwise in the meaning.
so just coming back then to these two words, uh, two meanings for the word Mukunda. Um, and then we'll move on after this to the next paragraph. So what is the two meanings? There's one meaning for the people in the material world. And there's another meaning for Mukunda for those in the spiritual world. Both is the name of Krishna. Mukunda is the name of Krishna. For those who are in the material world, they understand Mukunda in one way. And another way of understanding Mukunda is for this residence of spiritual world. Would someone like to share what these two meanings are? Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. 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 You said that. It's pretty. Oh, very well. Okay. It says in that paragraph that um, Mukunda muk means liberation. So Mukunda in that sense would mean the the person who can give liberation. So mm. that's like Krishna. And then also um, for people of Raj, um, they call him Mukunda because the um, muk here means face and the Kunda means flower. And that flower generally is like a, it appears to be smiling. So it's um, it's 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 that boy who's got a smiling face uh, that resemb you know that resembles that gunda flower as well. Yeah, very really nicely said. Thank you. So why are these two meanings are there? Because we want to follow in the footsteps of the Brajavasis. Hmm? And that, that, that basically means that we are only interested in seeing Krishna. We're not interested in being free from material life isn't our focus. Being free from this material world, attaining the spiritual world, that means that is also considered like a desire. I don't want this material world. I want the spiritual world because I want to be happy. It's, it's a bit more self-centered. You know, it's centered around what I want. Therefore, Krishna, I pray to you. Mukunda, I pray to you because you can give me what I want. <laughs> I want the spiritual world. So that's one way. Another way is Mukunda. Wow, look, he's so beautiful. His face is just smiling and he's just delighting everyone, his devotees. Huh? So I just want to see that face all the time, that form of Mukunda. So that's another meaning. So that's the that's the meaning of the residence of Vrindavan. They see Krishna in that way. So it's completely selfless, actually, because they're, they're completely focused on Krishna as the center of their attention. Is it is it more clear? Is that okay? Prabhuji, can I add something? Okay. So the kunda flower is like the jasmine flower. It's like this. Mm. Okay. I've never seen it before. Thanks for sharing that. <laughs> okay, so can... What did you... I can say. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yes. Um, in the Vedas, every page, every paragraph, every line, every word, Krishna is in it in the form of the highest authority. There is no higher authority than Krishna. So Krishna himself in the, every single world as a highest authority. Thank you for adding that, Prabhu. Yeah. So the Vedas are actually continually glorifying Krishna. You know? And Prabhupada says in Bhagavad Gita, um, this the syllable Om, Krishna says Pranava Sarva Vedeshu. Bhagavad Gita Krishna says that I am the syllable Om. And all of the mantras in the Vedas, they all begin with Om. All the prayers, they all begin with Om. So practically Krishna is there in every single line <laughs> of the Vedas. But the devotee, they, they see that Om as Krishna. Huh? 
and others do not. So they're lost. Okay, so we can continue to the next paragraph. Uh, who is our next reader? Um, Priti is the next reader, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, Hare Krishna, my um, internet connection is unstable, so it might maybe somebody else, because it will break in and out. Yes, anyone else who's willing to read? We appreciate I have another reader. Yes, please. Kirti Kamataji. Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Hare Krishna. The difference between the pure devotees of Rindavan and other devotees in that residence of Rindavan have no other desire but to be associated with Krishna. Krishna, being very kind to his devotees, fulfilled their desire because they always want Krishna's association. The Lord is always prepared to give it to them. The devotees of Rindavan are also spontaneous lovers. They do not follow the regulative principles. They are not required to strictly follow regulative principles because they are already naturally developed in transcendental love for Krishna. Regulative principles are required for persons who have not achieved the position of transcendental love. Brahma is also a devotee of the Lord, but he is subject to follow the regulative principles. He prays to give him the chance to take birth in Vrindavan so that he might be elevated to the platform of spontaneous love. Wow, Hare Krishna. <laughs> so, um, so devotional service, bhakti yoga, um, it can, it it is in two stages. The first stage of bhakti yoga is known as uh, the regulative stage, and the later stage, the advanced stage, is known as the spontaneous stage of bhakti yoga. So the regulative stage also is known as um, Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti or Vaidhi Raghunuga Bhakti or sorry, Raghunuga Sadhana Bhakti. So this is the beginning stage. These. And that's where we have to follow principles so that they can, the following these rules will help us become attached to Krishna. Okay. But someone who is already attached to Krishna because they've already attained the goal, then they don't need to follow rules again to become attached to Krishna. Okay? So already spontaneous, their love is there for Krishna. Um, so that's called Ragatmika Bhakti. That's the highest stage. Yeah. So first there's rules, that's called sa Sadhana Bhakti. Why the Sadhana Bhakti? Yeah? And then the, the high stage is called Raganuga, or sorry, Rag Atmika Bhakti, where that devotion is already within the Atma. So this is progressive devotional service. And we start with the rules. It's important for us to follow the rules so that we can become uh, free from uh, all the contaminations of the material world. We can become purified. We can become established in our relationship with Krishna. We can become focused on Krishna. Then when we are focused on Krishna, then no matter what we do actually, that focus will not go away. So like once it was explained to me in a class I heard, it was explained in this way. Let's suppose you have a husband and wife. And that husband and wife, they have problems in there, in the marriage, you know. Then what happens? There is like, you know, counseling and all these kind of things, isn't it? That happens in the modern world. You know, they have to be put in a room with a, a counsellor or, a, you know, um, like a psychologist or, and they said, and the psychologist will say, okay, now you speak to her. Okay, now you, you speak to him. <laughs> They're re-establishing the relationship again. 
know, it's done in a very regulated way. Okay, now you stop speaking. No, stop, stop, stop fighting, stop fighting. Okay, let her speak. <laughs> like this, isn't it? You see? So the relationship becomes on that stage. It's like, like a divorced relationship. So our relationship with Krishna, when he's in that divorced phase, we have to practice rules to, you know, learn to associate nicely together again. But when that is there, when that bond is there, with the husband and wife, even if there's a great big fight, then it doesn't matter because, you know, no one's going to run away. The attachment is already there. So though they may fight, the attachment is already there. The underlying attachment will always be there. So uh, does that make sense? I, have I explained that correctly? So I've heard this kind of explanation. So... We, pref we it's important, this is the point, so then it's important to perform the sadhana bhakti. It's important for us to follow the rules, reattach ourselves to Krishna. It's important to follow the rules under the guidance of a guru. Because the guru will say you're at this stage, you follow this much. Don't follow more, don't follow less. The next stage guru will say, now you follow this stage, you follow this. Until we become reconnected with Krishna. So we have basic rules. We follow the chanting, 16 rounds. And we follow four regulative principles. No meat eating, no gambling, no intoxication, no illicit sex. So we follow these principles. And we work up. If we're not following these, then we work up to that stage. And then from that stage, we can go further. So... Does anyone have any comments or questions on this? So I hope that's that's quite practical um, explanation. We can continue then. Um, Kirtika Mataji, would you like to read one more paragraph? Lord Brahma continued, My Lord, sometimes I'm puzzled as how your Lordship will be able to repay in gratitude, the devotional service of these residents of Vrindavan. Although I know that you are the supreme source of all benediction, I'm puzzled to know how you will be able to repay all the services that you are receiving from these residents of Vrindavan. I think of how you are so kind, so magnanimous, and even Putna, who came to cheat you by dressing herself as a very affectionate mother was awarded liberation and the actual post of a mother. And other demons belonging to the same family, such as Agasura and Bakasura, were also favored with liberation. Under the circumstances, I am puzzled. These residents of Rindavan have given you everything their bodies, their minds, their love, their homes. Everything is being utilized for your purpose. So how will you be able to repay their debt? You have already given yourself to Putna. I surmise, I surmise that you shall ever remain a debtor to the residents of Rindavan, being unable to repay their loving service. My Lord, I can understand that the super excellent service of the residents of Vrindavan is due to their spontaneously engaging all natural instincts in your service. It is said that the attachment for material objects and home is due to illusion, which makes a living entity conditioned in the material world. But this is only the case for persons who are not Krishna consciousness. In the case of residents of Vrindavan, such obstructions as attachment to hearth and home are non-existent. Because their attachment has been coverted onto you and their home has been co con converted into temple because you are always there, and because they have forgotten everything for your sake, 
there is no impediment. For a Krishna conscious person, there is no such thing as impediments in the heart of home, nor is there any illusion. Okay, so <clears throat> in this paragraph, Lord Brahma is coming from the perspective that Krishna, you reciprocate with your devotees. If your devotees do something to you, then you will reciprocate with that. You will give something back to them also. So you have this give and take relationship with your devotees. And in fact, Krishna does say that in Bhagavad Gita also. Yeah. He says that um, as, as you approach me, so I'll reciprocate accordingly. <clears throat> so why is he puzzled? Um, he's puzzled. He gives the example of Putana. How did, what was the award that Krishna gave Putana? What did Putana do to get liberation? Does anyone remember from when we read that chapter? So Putana came uh, as a cheater. She wanted to kill uh, baby Krishna. Mm -hmm. But because uh, Krishna drank her milk, he gave her the benediction to, he gave the position to her as a mother. In spite of her coming with an evil intent, uh, he, uh, she was given the benediction of being his mother. So isn't that really amazing? Huh? That someone came to, if someone comes to kill you by, uh, by poison, but there's some milk mixed in with the poison somehow, you know. <laughs> then you just accept the person gave you milk. <laughs> so this is Krishna. <laughs> so Lord Brahma, he's like, if you could do that to Putana, then what what can we say? Like, you know, these devotees are cent per cent sold out to you. It's, you know, how can you even repay them? Krishna even says himself in Srimad Bhagavatam, Na Parayanaham, I cannot repay you. I cannot give any, there's nothing I can give to you. So he sold out to the devotees of Vrindavan. Um, and we see how the residents of Vrindavan are sold out to him. For example, the gopis, uh, the young, the young coward girls, they give up everything when they hear the sound of Krishna's fruit, flute in the night. And they give up, they're in the homes uh, with their newly wed husbands, or with their baby children. And when they hear Krishna's flute in the middle of the night, because they have that attachment to Krishna already, they run from their homes, they run from their duties, they put down their children, and they run out, and they go and dance with Krishna at night. <laughs> so who can understand that position of the gopis? No one can understand because Krishna is the Lord of the heart. Uh, they're not running out to, you know, an, just another ordinary boy. They're running out to the Paramatma, the, the, the Lord of the heart. Krishna is the form of that Paramatma. He's the Lord of the heart. So there's no conflict of interest, you see. Krishna is actually the husband of everyone. Huh? And these gopis, they're not ordinary also. Just as Krishna is an ordinary, he doesn't mix with ordinary girls. They're all Mahalakshmis. They're all Lakshmis. In the form of these gopis performing this Leela. So therefore it's very puzzling when Krishna performs such pastimes. And people say that Krishna is immoral, that Krishna is, you know, contaminated and so on and so forth. Because the understanding of who is Krishna, the Supreme Personality, is not there. So even though Vedas, they talk about these subjects, there's so much misunderstanding as to what's actually happening. Krishna is simply reciprocating with his pure devotees through the form of the pastime. And the form of the pastime is, um, is, called, para, is called Parakya Rasa. So, He's reciprocating with the position that the gopis are in. So this paragraph is, is very much saying that 
uh, Krishna is indebted to the devotees because they're so surrendered to him. Okay. So unless there's any comments or questions, we'll move on. My screen, my screen is frozen there. And unless there's any comments or questions, we can move on. Is there anyone else who could read? Last paragraph. Be nice to have an, uh, another reader. I can read Prabhupada if you want. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, yes, please. Yeah. So reading a uh, paragraph which begins, I can also understand. Yeah. I can also understand that your appearance as a small coward boy, a child of the coward man, is not at all a material activity. You are so much obliged by the affection that you are here to enthuse them with more loving service by your transcendental presence. In Vrindavan, there is no distinction between material and spiritual because everything is dedicated to your loving service. My dear Lord, your Vrindavan pastimes are simply to enthuse your devotees. If someone takes your Vrindavan pastimes to be material, he will be misled. Could you also read the next one, please, Mataji? Yeah. My dear Lord Krishna, those who deride you, claiming that you have a material body like an ordinary man, are described in Bhagavad Gita as demonic and less intelligent. You are always transcendental. The non-devotee are cheated because they consider you to be a material creation. Actually, you have assumed this body which resembles that of an ordinary coward boy simply to increase the devotion and transcendental bliss of your devotees. To carry on. You can just pause there. Okay. Yes, Krishna does say in Bhagavad Gita that um, <clears throat> The fools deride me when I Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Sorry, I've got a notice here saying your internet connection is unstable. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can, Prabhu. Yeah? Okay, I'll continue. If I can blurs at any point, please let me know. You said before, because you were frozen. Yeah, let me know if it's cutting out. Okay. Krishna says that um, fools deride me when I appear in this human-like form. So people who haven't understood the Vedas, they comment that Krishna's activities are illicit or immoral or a fairy tale and they can't quite understand um, and therefore that's why Krishna is considered the absolute truth he's considered the the supreme truth because even those who are uh, on the path of Brahman or those who are on the path of Paramatma realization even for those people it's difficult to understand Krishna so therefore, being a more difficult subject matter is higher than other parts of spiritual understanding. Hmm? So it can be understood in this way also. Understanding Krishna is the highest. So it's very wonderful then that we can study this Krishna book because this is actually the highest understanding. Just understanding Krishna's pastimes is the highest understanding. And we don't need to understand so much about the Paramatma, so much about Brahman. If we are sent to sent, uh, sold out to Krishna, if we have love for Krishna, then other things will also be included in, in that. Is that okay? Not sure if you can hear me. 
Yes, Prabhu, we can hear you. Okay. And I have a question. Uh, okay. So I have never been to Vrindavan, but uh, maybe some devotees or you have, must have gone to Vrindavan. What is it like? <laughs> what can we say? <laughs> uh, how do you mean? <laughs> so do you experience Krishna when you go there? Uh, I mean, I'm sure. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's very humbling being in Vrindavan. It's very humbling. Like in this prayer, how Lord Brahma is saying, you know, um, being in Vrindavan, you know, even if I was just a blade of grass in Vrindavan, that would be such a wonderful thing. It's very wonderful being in Vrindavan because when you go there, you just feel like Krishna gives you so much mercy. Krishna gives you so much love there. You feel Krishna's presence so strongly there. It's so transformative. It's so powerful and uplifting, enlivening. And you think, you know, I'm just an ordinary, you know, like what have I done to deserve this? <laughs> just by going to Vrindavan, you get that. That was my experience. I'm sure others will have um, profound experiences beyond mine. Uh, but that, because Krishna reciprocates with you, it's very humbling. It's very um, uplifting. It's very profound. It's very memorable. Transformative. Wow. Yeah. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yeah, go on, speak up. Yeah, but he's not responding. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. You can hear you. Hare Krishna. Right. What I like to add, there are so many things, uh, good things in Vrindavan, but out of all those, most beautiful thing is people are chanting Radhe Radhe. Okay. Can you elaborate on that, Prabhu? Right. You walk in the street of Vrindavan or you are uh, sitting one place or talking to someone. It's all, it's all you hear. Even, even when the rickshawala uh, wants, uh, wants you to out of the way for a reason and they just chant uh, Radhe Radhe Everybody instead of saying yeah. excuse Everybody instead of saying Radhe Radhe, Radhe. You yeah. like, uh, instead of saying excuse me mm. or blah 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 yes thank you Prabhu so yeah the whole vibration in Vrindavan is filled with the name of Srimati Radharani yeah, and when, when you, you're doing parikrama and uh, devotees are explaining, then you Sorry, are you talking? Prabhu? Yeah. Okay. So what, I, what I'm saying, Radha Rani is the, Radha Rani is the boss of Vrindavan. Yes, that's right, Prabhu. <laughs> Mataji was saying something. Yeah, I was saying like when you go for Parikrama and we go and see uh, like uh, have darshan of all the places and when it's there, uh, the witches are explaining us, you feel that you are in that past time with them. Personally, you get into that past times. Mm. So that is powerful. So, so nice. Just cannot imagine. There's, you have to experience that. Yeah. And you feel like it's, uh, you are there, present, that everything is present at that time. So it's very really, difficult to describe in words. Yeah, it's so <laughs> difficult to describe. <laughs> you just have to go there. What else can we say? <laughs> yeah, you have to make a visit.
Anyone else like to share? I know a little bit over time. I hope the devotees don't mind. Yeah, hi Krishna. Um, okay. Sorry, did somebody else want to share? Jay Prakash Prabhu? Yeah, and if you're really lucky, if you actually meet some devotees there, and if you're in an association, it's just wonderful. I mean, I've been there a couple of times, but a couple of weeks, two years ago, uh, we were going to stay in Mathura, and we ended up in Vrindavan next to the uh, temple. I met a couple of devotees. They just took us around, and it was just amazing. You know, I mean, one devotee used to go, he did go with the Parikrama during Kartik every day. And uh, he became so friendly with people that he used to actually go into their houses and bring us chapatis to eat. I mean, that's how humbling uh, experience you get. It's, it's amazing. It's just, I mean, because of COVID, unluckily, but we were supposed to be there like now, but it was not meant to be. But yeah, it's an experience. Uh, Krishna will make his way. And uh, you, you, you definitely is worth visiting. Thank you, Prabhu. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was very inspiring. I had someone else joining. Yeah, Hare Krishna. Okay, just hold on, Prabhu. Something to say. Okay, Preeti. Yes. Yeah. So I, I just can say like uh like how Madhavi Mati is playing um when you see the different places where the pastimes took place and someone there just gives you like background on what happens and because you've read about it or you're already connected to Krishna. And just and getting goosebumps, I know I did. Um, especially places like Nidhi Bhavan. Yeah, it's just something uh, surreal about that place. Mm -hmm. And um, even um, Brindakund, I think that's the one. Yeah, yeah. really nice. In the David Temple. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, any final, any final? You want to say something? Yeah, very well, yeah. Okay, just yeah, hold on. Prabhu wants to say something. Please. So, okay, go on, Prabhu. Hari Bol. Hari Bol. When uh, Krishna wanted to come from a spiritual world to an earthly planet, and he wanted Radharani to come, and Radha Rani said, no, she can't come because she didn't want to leave uh, Vrindavan. Vrindavan. Uh, all this uh, Govardhan Hill, etc., uh, etc. Et so, Radha Rani said, if you take this Vrindavan to earthly planet, then I will come. So, Krishna created uh, Another Vindavan on our three planet, same as uh, 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 Golok Vindavan, and that's uh, and that's how Radharani came uh, on this planet. Otherwise, she was not going to. Wow, I've never heard that before. That's amazing. <laughs> yes, and uh, uh, that is the reason I said earlier on. Uh, that's the reason Radha Rani is the boss of Vrindavan. <laughs> that's right. She's Vrindavan Ishwari. Vrindavan Ishwari. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> interesting. Yeah. so I thought I just mentioned that. Yeah, thank you for adding that. Yeah, that puts everything into nice perspective. Um, so I'd just like to finish by saying a couple of things now. And um, firstly, I just want to say thank you all for, the, for those who have um, completed the questionnaire. We sent out a little questionnaire survey asking for your uh, feedback on the group. Uh, this was a couple of weeks ago. I haven't really 
had the time, unfortunately, to go through all the answers in detail. I've had a read of it, so I appreciate all your comments and feedback. And slowly we'll be um, implementing some of those things, which we can. Um, so that's coming in the next few weeks. Um, and then secondly, uh, from this Friday, I believe, is the start of the month, most holy month, known as Kartik. Yeah? And this month of Kartik is very dear to none other than Srimati Radharani. Hmm? So, um, devotees traditionally offer candles. Every day we offer a candle to the Lord in a deity form or in the form of his picture. Um, in particular to the form uh, of Damodar, which is Krishna being tied by Madhya Yashoda. So if you have that picture, then uh, or if, you, or if you can get that picture, yes, which is on Kirti Kamataji screen, ready for Kartik. <laughs> then offer, do offer a candle every day to this form of the Lord. It gives special blessings in this month. We can excel our spiritual lives because this month is Radharani's month. Therefore, whatever is dear to Radharani is dear to Krishna. And so Krishna gives extra blessings in summary. <clears throat> And many other wonderful festivals in this month of Damodar. So, um, so yeah, please encourage you to increase your sadhana, increase your spiritual practice, your chanting, offering of arati, and in different ways, uh, offering prasadam every day, eating only prasadam. So, I encourage you to increase your spiritual practice uh, for the month of Karthik. And I wish you all. Uh, good week ahead. Look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you for those of you who could stay on for longer. Um, have a blessed week. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. Jai. Yeah. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.